So, uh, we have just started the, the recording of the webinar and we will get started now. So, my name is Maria Neumann, I'm Director of Mental Health Europe and I'm really pleased to welcome you all today to this webinar on employment for all and showing access to the labour market for people living with mental ill health. So what we will be discussing today um, are the obstacles to access the labour market. For people living with mental ill health, we will talk about psychosocial disability. I will explain more about that. We will be uh, presenting the policy framework at the European level, international level. We will talk about um, existing employment schemes for, for people living with mental ill health. Um, we will also be addressing a bit um, the, the economic case for employing people with, with mental health uh, problems and also, and also about uh, discussing maintain, maintaining people at work, um, people with mental ill health, people that get um, sick at the job. But first, before doing that, uh, just give you a few housekeeping rules for those of you who are maybe not as familiar with the webinars. Um, so there are some, uh, some features that you can use. You will be able to ask questions. Um, you will be able to, to chat with us as well uh, during the, the webinar. And we will have a couple of, um, of occasions after the presentations where you will be able to, to intervene with questions. You can already ask them in the chat. Uh, we can also, if your microphone works, you can ask questions during the, the, the Q&A sessions that we will have, as I said, after the presentations. Uh, and then we will unmute you, so that's uh, if you have the option of a microphone. But uh, please um, write the question first, if possible, in the chat. That makes it a little bit easier for us to, to handle. And then there is the, the handouts function. You will see um, that, you, that we have uploaded three different documents that you can download. Um, it's the slides, so you will have access to the slides. Um, it's a report as well uh, on the Europe of the European Network of Legal Experts in Gender Equality and Non-Discrimination and uh, we also have an article by one of our speakers today, Bob Grove, that you will be able to download from there as well. So just uh, very few words about uh, Mental Health Europe, who we are and, and what we do. Uh, we are a European umbrella organization. We work on mental health promotion, prevention of mental health problems, and we also advocate for the rights of people with mental ill health. We have a wide membership, so around 73 members um, from 30 European countries. We also have a number of individual members from across Europe. And we have been working actively in the field of mental health since 1985. We um, are proud to have a very diverse membership, um, mental health professionals, national organizations, uh, NGOs, service providers as, as well, as uh, users and ex-users of mental health services, family organizations. And we have a few strategic priorities that are of interest for today as well, especially we work um, from a human rights perspective, a recovery-based uh, approach to mental health. And we believe in parity of esteem, meaning that mental health um, has the same values, equally important as physical health, and that they are um, interlinked. We promote deinstitutionalization, so we promote community-based care um, and uh, quality care, I mean quality community-based care. And we do work on mental health at work. That is one of our strategic priorities of, of great interest for today's discussion, of course. And uh, Mental Health Europe is part of the European Alliance on Employment and Work. It's an informal coalition of, of a number of European organizations. Um, we work jointly with other organizations to promote mental health and well-being in the workplace. We advocate for equal access to the labor market for all. Um, and uh, we work to stimulate the policies of relevance at the European level. You will see the website um, of the Alliance where you'll get more information as well. 
So to today's topic, ensuring access to the labor market for people living with mental ill health. Well, if the right policies and practices are in place, then employment for, mental, for people with mental ill health can have many benefits for, for, for the mental health. And uh, it can also be essential for the recovery process. Although um, the workplace in itself also has some psychosocial risk factors, um, which are really important to know about. So we will hear a little bit more about that as well. Uh, what kind of work is, is good for you? Um, it can also give um, a sense of identity and be important for, for the self-worth of a person. But there are very many barriers that remain um, and prevent persons from mental, uh, persons with mental ill health from uh, being um, in the open labor market, getting access to it. It can be at all stages, from the recruitment stage, um, or it can be due to inadapted work arrangement or discriminatory practices, even dismissal uh, because of your um, mental health problems. Uh, because there are a lot of misconceptions and stigma when it comes to, to mental health and work. So what is important to know um, is that there is a right to non-discrimination in the field of employment at the EU level. At the European level and the international levels, there are two main instruments that protect people with psychosocial disabilities from disc discrimination. And here I'll um, adapt my terminology a little bit, so I'm speaking about psychosocial disability, um, which is um, mental health problems that are more long-standing, um, more severe, that are considered in the, um, the, the, um, the, within the main um, for, um, human rights, um, well, the, the UN Convention that I will present, and also the Equal Employment Directive that I will, uh, will be saying a couple of words about, um, they do cover persons with psychosocial disabilities from discrimination. And um, so there are also other um, international conventions and we will hear a little bit more about them later when Stefan Trommel will, will be speaking. So the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I mentioned it, um, it's the Article 27 that is of most relevance. Then there is the another important um, uh, instrument at the European level is the Equal Imp Employment Directive from, from 2000, um, which grants equality of treatment for, treatment for persons with disabilities. Um, and although it's not clear in the directive itself, that it also covers persons with psychosocial disabilities, the, the, uh, the European Court of Justice has confirmed that it does. Um, and um, so in order to work on equal terms as other people, there is a right to reasonable accommodation, and that's a very important concept um, also in that directive. Um, now, there is a report that you can download from our handouts that gives you a great overview of the directive itself. Um, so what I will do now is just to say a few words also about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was adopted back in 2006. It has been uh, concluded by the EU um, as the first human rights convention ever. It has been ratified by 27 of the EU member states and uh, the 28th uh, will shortly follow. So um, the Article 27 of the UNCRPD is the core article when it comes to, to the field of employment. And it's really comprehensive and I will not go through um, all the aspects of it today. I will just mention a few of the most important points um, for people with psychosocial disabilities um, of Article 27. So the first one is the right to work in the open labor market on an equal basis as others. That goes for the public sector and the private sector. And there is a prohibition of discrimination for all forms of employment. And during all the stages, um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, from the very beginning, um, the, the, the interview stage, um, until during, uh, during your, your work. And, um, um, and uh, it, also, it also promotes opportunities of maintain, maintaining employment and returning to work, also of great importance for persons with uh, 
psychosocial disabilities. And uh, very importantly, there is um, the right to reasonable accommodation, all that. Try to highlight it, didn't do that very well. <laughs> but uh, that is a very fundamental concept um, that I will um, explain a little bit about. So now I need to take out that highlight. Um, so the reasonable accommodation, sorry, um, shall be tailored to the individual needs of the person, him or herself. Um, it should be provided, um, if needed, obviously. I mean, not all persons will need, um, will have specific needs. But if you need reasonable accommodation, it should be provided, unless there is a disproportionate or undue burden for the employer. But that obligation goes quite far. Um, so, from the for, for the from the side of the employer, I mean, um, even if there will be, be costs involved, uh, it does not necessarily it, it's not necessarily considered as as undue because of that. You have a very wide um, reaching right to reasonable accommodation for persons with sex, social disabilities. That can mean, for example, flexible work time arrangements, or maybe you need a more quiet work workplace. Um, you might need adapted supervision or instructions, or you might have preferences when it comes to means of communication. Um, it can also be about specific equipment that you may need or may not need um, at the workplace. And if you do not provide this reasonable accommodation as the employer, you, um, that is discrimination. It is considered discrimination. So that was just a little bit of an introduction about uh, the rights, um, the, the framework at the European and international level. And now I will pass the floor to my colleague uh, Bob Grove, who is Senior Policy Advisor at um, Mental Health Europe. And uh, he will give um, a bit of, um, um, of an overview of the main subject for today. So now I'll switch the, uh, the camera to Michael Ibogro. Welcome. Thank you, Marie, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on my first webinar, so there will probably be a few technical hitches, but never mind, we'll get over it. Um, I want to just say briefly about myself. I'm uh, now retired, but uh, for the last 30 years of my career, then employment and mental health was right at the center of my work. It is my work and my passion. And um, I, I have been involved in this world both as a service provider and for a lot of years as a researcher and an academic at King's College London and then the Center for Mental Health. So um, I've been uh, involved a long time. And the reason is basically that I came to learn what many people have learned for many hundreds of years, about a couple of hundred years, that work actually is really pretty good for your health and it is pretty good for your mental health. Um, ten or more years ago, some academics in London, Gordon Waddell and Ken Burton, uh, did actually an academic study answering the question, is work good for you? And they came to a, a very important conclusion, yes, work is good for health. Um, and for mental health, but they qualified it and said actually it's good work, it's good for mental health, and I think that's really important to remember. Can you still see me? I'm not sure you can. Anyway, there we go. Um, as Maria says, work for people with mental health is often uh, a very important part um, of recovery. Um, and. Work takes many forms. For many people, paid work is very important. Many people, not everybody. Um, and when you ask people who say they don't really want a, a paid job, then and you dig down into it, then often you find it's because actually work has been so traumatic for them that they just don't believe they will ever find a job that they can do that will not sink them back into the pit of depression and, and, and anxiety. So when we're thinking about work, we need to think about what is good work and how people can be helped into a job that they like, that they can do, and which builds their confidence rather than knocks them sideways. I'm going to concentrate on the practical 
ways of getting people into paid work, into proper jobs. Um, a little while ago, as Maria says, I wrote a paper which covered international employment schemes, and you can download this from the website. website. Um, and just for convenience sake, I, I divided the things that people have tried uh, in the way of routes to open employment into four. Uh, sheltered work, vocational training, transitional employment, which I'll explain when we get to it, and, and supported employment. Most of my talk is going to be about supported employment, and, but I thought I'd just deal with the others first very briefly. Sheltered work was very popular in the second half of the 20th century. A lot of sheltered workshops were set up, but uh, and these were specially constructed, protected environments based on the idea, basically, that people couldn't cope with ordinary jobs. Now, for that reason, they have been disappearing from mental health services across the world. Um, but because once you set them up, they're pretty difficult to close down, then actually there's still some uh, persisting in various places. I, I include in my paper social firms and cooperatives as sheltered work to some degree, um, but they have in many ways overcome some of the, the big difficulties about sheltered work, and, and so I wouldn't want it to be thought that I'm not very positive about them. I can answer questions on that at some other point. Why are they going well? The aspirations of mental health service users have changed. People don't want to be segregated in, in uh, institutions, whether they're residential institutions or work institutions. The quality of work in sheltered workshops was very often poor quality, very repetitive, um, and, and quite out of kilter with what was going on in the ordinary workplace. And of course, there was the segregation from the workaday world. Um, I had this naive idea back in the 1980s that if you moved a sheltered workshop from the hospital onto an industrial site then some, by some uh, miracle, then people would suddenly move from the sheltered workshop into, into proper jobs. And of course, it, it didn't happen at all. In my first sheltered workshop, then the numbers of people who uh, got actually from there to proper jobs was exactly the same as from the hospital-based workshop, about 5%. Uh, and those were 5% were, were not people we helped into work, but people who escaped, basically. Um, and there's a very low transition from the open labor into the open labor market and very high costs. When the last of the big sheltered in workshops for disabled people in Britain closed, um, then the average cost per person per year was about £25,000, which is a pretty decent salary, really. We might as well just have given them the salary uh, and told them to uh, enjoy themselves. Vocational training, still very popular across Europe, and based on, I think, probably um, the idea that one trains people and then places them, that people have a, a deficit in skills. And, and, and routine and confidence that training will address and then once you've got them to the point where everyone agrees they are now capable then you move them into work. Actually these train and place methods are have certainly in the UK and elsewhere quite a poor record. What is the problem? Well part of it is that actually the training that you can give, basic generic training schemes, do not prepare people for the modern labour market. Actually, most employers do that sort of training themselves and expect people to come with a fairly basic education. And anyway, the many people who, who go into these training schemes actually are already pretty well qualified. Uh, the problems, the barriers are, are not lack of skills. Um, and the big problem is that actually what being trained into these kind of basic skills says to the person themselves. Um, people have gone into these hoping to get a proper job and gradually that as they get into the training the job recedes as a possibility. Um, and so instead of improving people's confidence, actually what it does is get people used to being in training, not used to being in a job. Um, and we call this the training roundabout, accumulating certificates, which are not unenjoyable to acquire, but actually never getting basic jobs. Um, and so vocational training schemes, train and place, um, have a poor record. Uh, and we'll 
look at how what the evidence for that is in, in, in due course. Transitional employment was in, invented really by clubhouses, but you could also call it work experience. In clubhouses, very interesting idea, uh, which has been going for many years, starting with the Fountain House model, where people um, are given work that basically is found by the clubhouse. Jobs belong to the clubhouse. Clubhouse members go and do the job for a period. They get paid to do it, um, and it it is safer for them and the employer because if they can't do it, if their health deteriorates, it very reasonably move on, then someone else from the clubhouse will take on this job. Um, and for some, this is uh, a relatively risk-free form of employment commitment, and uh, it's said to boost people's confidence, certain people enjoy it, and particularly the pay. Um, there are problems with it. Firstly, actually, it isn't a permanent job, and people, once they've got you know, used to a job, uh, find the transition to another job and to the open labour market quite difficult. Another thing is that these jobs, by their very nature, are pretty entry-level jobs, um, and so they don't really move people along very much. However, the clubhouse movement has moved with the times. The international clubhouse standards now include the provision of individually employed, individually supported employment opportunities, which means that um, on occasions, at least, when people move into from their transitional uh, employment, they can actually move into uh, another job or the same job with the employer or be supported to find another job that is um, a permanent job. So uh, the clubhouse standards are, uh, are very important and, and um, their form of supported employment is really indistinguishable from others, which I will come to in a minute. So. I've talked about supported employment. What do I mean by it? Well, supported employment comes from, actually from the world of people with intellectual disabilities, the job coach model. Basically, it is a place then train method. It prioritizes putting people in real jobs and supporting them and training them while they're, rather than pairing them endlessly for work, placing them and then abandoning them which I call the place and abandon method. Um, and it's that and how supported employment overcomes the real barriers that I really want to talk about today. I'm particularly going to talk about individual placement and support because that's where the evidence says that the most effective ways are of getting people into paid employment. I want to talk about what the evidence tells us, what are the key principles of individual placement and support, I particularly want to talk about why it works, because it's one thing to say, you know, it works and there are these principles and that kind of thing, but I think it's important to understand how it addresses the real barriers to work, and I want to spend a little bit more time there talking about that. And finally, a very brief thing on how to implement it, how um, across the world people have started building these services. So, what does the evidence say? Well. The gold standard of um, uh, research reviews um, is the Cochrane Collaboration. And there have been two Cochrane Collaboration uh, reviews of individual placement and support, support and employment, which basically pulls together, it's a kind of meta-analysis, pulls together all the studies, all the high quality studies, randomized controlled trials that have been done. Um, and, and tries to put together some kind of consensus finding about the research. Randomized controlled trials, well, here we, we, we are talking about controls where there are, the trials where there are, it's an intervention group, uh, a group which um, has a particular form of, of intervention, and a control group which either has another type of intervention with which it is being compared, or no intervention at all. Um, in all of the RCTs, randomized controlled trials for supported employment, the control group has been another form of getting people into work, sheltered work, vocational training, sometimes on one or two occasions, transitional employment. Basically, it is trying to see which is the most or more effective method of getting people into paid work. And the conclusion from the last Cochrane Review was the same, really, as for the previous Cochrane Review, which was back in the early part of this century, 
Firstly, supported employment increases the length and the time, um, in other words, the number of hours people do, uh, the number of time, length of the time they keep their job and the number of hours they do, compared with employment attained by other means. And people on supported employment find jobs quicker, and support employment and IPS are better than other approaches in these two respects. So that is the, the kind of meta-analysis. Um, there have also been um, a longitudinal study. Longitudinal studies are very useful because it's, very, it's all very well to say, okay, so here's an intervention at a particular point in time. It works better than this intervention at this particular point in time. If you really want to know what's working, you need to look down the line to see if people are keeping jobs and that their health is being maintained. And the article that I quoted here says, the results demonstrate that the greater effectiveness of supported employment in improving competitive work outcomes is sustained beyond two years and suggests that supported employment programs contribute to reduced hospitalizations and produce a higher social return on investment. This is a, a slightly busy slide, but I think it would, what I included it for is, it, it is really to show that there have been a lot of randomized control trials that have gone into these meta-analysis. Um, if you look at the um, uh, line on the left, the axis up here, sorry, I'm not the axis which has the percentages, uh, then you have the percentage of participants in a program who obtained paid work. Um, if you look along the bottom axis, um, then you see where the studies... Ooh. <laughs> Good. I'm receiving some assistance here. It's okay. Good. Good. Um, and as you will see, broadly speaking, in all the trials there is a consistent finding um, that IPS rates of employment paid work double the alternative methods. I want to, you to see particularly this one because I'm going to refer to it later and here I'm going to um, see if I can find a pen and highlight um, and get rid of this. I don't know how do I do that. Okay. No. No. Okay, let's go back to the slide. I will, try, I will, I will abandon efforts of highlighting it. No, what does that do? <laughs> yeah, it does. Okay, there you go. Sorry about this, folks. Right, I'm giving up. You'll see um, about um, six or seven from the right hand end, the European trial. And it's, that's the one that I want to, to talk about, because this was a trial that was done, a uh, randomized control trial that was done across a number of European countries. Um, the Equalized Randomized Control Trial, it compared traditional vocational services, non-integrated training place with people with IPS for people with schizophrenia in the UK, Germany, Italy, Bulgaria, Switzerland and the Netherlands. And it was led by um, a psychiatrist called Tom Burns. Tom Burns, it has to be said, was a skeptic and uh, he was entering this rather thinking that there would be no very impressive results. Um, he was particularly concerned that he thought actually as a psychiatrist that probably if there were people who got into work it would damage their mental health. He was surprised and, and in fact emerged as an advocate of IPS. 55% in the IPS employment group, intervention group, uh, obtained paid work compared with 28% in the traditional services across these European countries. There was a, a much larger dropout rate in the traditional services. And for, to Tom's great surprise, actually the numbers readmitted to hospital 
uh, within the programs were much less in the IPS groups than they were in the traditional services. So there was a reduction in hospital admissions for those in employment, but no deterioration in health. Which, as a psychiatrist, he felt this was very important. Now, clearly, getting people into paid work is difficult. 55% is not perfect. It is not a magic bullet. It is not the answer to everything. It is, however, significantly better than anything else. And that's really the point that I'm wanting to, to make, because we don't know in the end how good we can make it, but certainly this seems to be on the right lines. IPS services have developed a lot. They originated in North America in the mid-1990s, and over these 20, 25 years have now been developed pretty widely across the English-speaking world, but also in, in uh, parts of Europe um, and in, in Asia. So it's beginning to catch on, but very patchy. The biggest development undoubtedly is in North America, uh, where it is supported by uh, Dartmouth College, uh, um, and they have a, a really big program, which I'll tell you about in the implementation bit. So what is it? Well, there are eight evidence-based principles. And I want to dwell on them because they sound sort of pretty um, common sense, really, and a bit, you know, non-magical. But each of them is carefully designed to deal with the real barriers that people experience. And, and I'll come to what I mean by the real barriers. So let's start with... Eligibility is based on individual choice, no exclusions. One of the barriers that we find in the UK, and I think it's pretty general really, is that when it comes to employment programmes, the recommendations of mental health workers, psychiatrists, mental health nurses, social workers, tend to be very influential. And people therefore are held back because their social worker or their mental health worker doesn't think they're ready for work. When Bob Drake, who's the kind of founder of IPS, says, was asked, well, who gets in your programs? He says, anyone who holds their hand up. We as mental health workers are very bad at predicting who will be able to work. The main criterion is that people want to work. And once they've said they want to work, it is our job to try our best to get them the kind of job that they want and the kind of job that they can do. So that's that's one. Competitive employment is the goal. Okay, competitive paid employment, the kind of real jobs. Why do we need to say this? Well, because actually it is a lot easier for people who are running support services to get people into voluntary work. Very good, good in itself or into a sheltered workshop, or other forms of employment, it is much more difficult to get them into paid work because that actually involves dealing with the real world of employers. And so when we say that this is a principle, it means that there's no program drift. If your IPS service is saying we get people real jobs, then what they're measured on is getting people real jobs, not getting them something else. Three. Employment support is integrated with treatment. Back to the barriers within the medical profession. The medical profession, on the whole, has in the past tended to try and protect people from work rather than encourage them to get work. And also to try and promote the idea that you have to wait till someone is ready in the medical sense, cured, I don't know what, what we'll describe as ready in the medical sense, to before putting them into an employment program. What IPS says is that actually people can still be receiving treatment, can still be in a medical program, still be supported by medical services and work. And what is more, it reminds people in medical services that it is their job to help people recover and to help them work, not their job to protect them from work. Four, rapid job search. Well, this is back to the kind of sheltered work barrier, the barrier which means that if people spend a really long time in another program, then they get institutionalized into it and they lose heart. People 
who are wanting work want to be able to see results quite quickly, quickly enough in order that they can see that the reality of their dreams is within reach. Leave it too long and they give up. And so rapid job search at least is quite important. So people are reminded that that is their goal. Job finding and all assistance is individualized. Well, that almost goes without saying, but actually it is the diametric opposite of saying, well, here are a number of entry level jobs that people can do. Which one of them do you want? What IPS does is to say, what are your employment ambitions? What are your dreams? What kind of work do you think you could do? If you really had a terrible time in, in your previous career, okay, you can't in all conscience want to do that again, okay. So what can you do? What would you like to do? What are the kind of things? And that's when we start looking at things that uh, are out there that actually fit what people's ambitions are. And alongside that, employers are approached, number six, with individuals in mind. Now, one of the key things about IPS is that it is based really on a different way of getting people jobs to the conventional labour market. Conventional labour market tends to be, okay, employers advertise a job, drop a person specification, hold interviews, uh, look at CVs, that kind of thing. Um, and in that way, pretty much anyone with mental health problems is going to be at a disadvantage. Firstly, they will have a patchy employment record. Secondly, they will be judged by their condition, not by their uh, ability or what they are as a person. So they, in fact, never get past the first step. The job of the employment support work is to start introducing employers to real people with real skills and with real ambitions. And that means having the courage to approach employers and to start building relationships with them, bypassing all those barriers of the conventional labour market that people are um, disadvantaged by. Now, clearly not all jobs are amenable to this, but in the fidelity scale, the which is what the way IPS teams check that they're doing the right thing, then one of the high level of fidelity criteria is to have three face-to-face -face contacts with employers each week. Every employment support worker, three face-to-face -face contacts with employers each week, which means basically you have to be quite skilled and quite brave to go and approach employers and say, look, I've got this really good person. Can you find a job that is going to fit their needs and because they, if, they if, you, if you do then you will be richly rewarded. Seven, follow along supports are continuous. This is the, the place and train bit. Actually what you do is place people and then support and train them while they're in point of fact, I mean, this is one of the things that terrifies the people who pay for supported employment services. What? Indefinite support forever for people in work? This is too much. Actually, this is much more about reassurance than it is about costly support that needs to be uh, introduced into the workplace. What it does, what it says, is it says to the person who's got the job, look, we are here to support you for as long as you have that job. When you change that job, when you lose that job, we are still here to support you. And what it says to the employer is, we are here to support you, to make sure that you uh, um, uh, have your needs met as an employer, that uh, we uh, make sure that if there are mental health needs by this, with this person who is in your, who's your employee, then we make sure that they are met. You don't need to worry. We take away quite a lot of the risks of employing this person. And finally, financial planning. Number eight, financial planning is provided. Many of our, perhaps all of the people who have long-term mental health conditions in pretty much all European countries have some kind of state support, disability benefits, pensions, that kind of thing. And very often that state support is ended once someone gets a job. Sometimes there are tapering arrangements, sometimes there are other ways of making sure that people can earn a bit without losing all, all their welfare planning, welfare assistance. 
the important thing is that whichever country you're in, then part of the IPS service, part of the job of the employment support worker is to make sure that people are not disadvantaged and thrown into poverty by getting the job. So financial planning, very essential. So I hope what I've done there is to try and say, well, look, you know, these may sound common sense, but actually, if you look at them, they are addressing all the barriers, and all of them are necessary. This is not a pick and choose thing. You have to pay attention to all these principles. The evidence suggests that the greater fidelity to the model, the better the job outcomes. The little study in Sussex in England which looked at um, whether if you had more disabled people going into your employment support service by some measures, um, then you would be less likely to get people work than in another service where the people were less disabled. In fact, actually, the uh, predictor, the best predictor of employment outcomes was not how disabled people were at the beginning, but how closely the service was faithful to the model, how closely it performed to the model. Um, we know that employment specialist skills and results improve with good experience and, and good supervision particularly. This is a stressful and a skilled job. Learning how to talk to employers, for example, requires a lot of practice, a lot of training, and a lot of support from your supervisor because that's some of the most difficult things to do. So the longer people are able to develop their skills, the better is their, their work. Good record keeping and regular fidelity reviews improve, improve performance. IPS works on keeping records, making sure that each of the eight principles are adhered to and that there is a record of the fact that they are being adhered to. And having someone come in and actually what's, hold what is called a fidelity review and you can get packs that help you do this uh, from Dartmouth and from the Centre for Mental Health. Um, a fidelity review is, is very useful. It gives an outside pair of eyes. It gives someone who is not part of your service a chance to look through, ask questions and make sure that you haven't become institutionalized into poor practice. The other thing is, uh, and, and this is in three countries, I think maybe more now, but started in the US. In order to develop these services on a larger scale, uh, in the United States, they got federal funding for what are called state trainer programs. In the United Kingdom, we call them regional or county trainer programs. This means that you have an experienced employment support manager working with a number of services within the same area uh, as a trainer, uh, uh, as a supervisor, as a supporter that helps people get off to a, a, a good start. They don't have to just go on a training program and go away and do it. There's someone there all the time supporting them. These um, are now starting to be written up and are, are very interesting. Again, if anyone is interested in seeing the results of some of these state training programs, there's been some good published evaluations of them. So to conclude, train and place models involving extensive and sometimes endless work preparation do not work on the whole but still far too common. IPS is not a magic bullet. It won't get everyone into work, but it is the best we have, and it seems to be effective across different cultures and language groups. And thirdly, and most importantly, you have to understand why it works and how to continuously improve, in perform improve performance. These are the keys to successful implementation. Thank you. Um, there's a little link there to the in paper overview paper I wrote, um, but I've referred to a lot of other papers. And uh, anyone who wants can send uh, a request for the other papers I've referred to, or books or whatever, uh, to Mental Health Europe, and I will make sure that you get uh, to know how you can get hold of them. Thank you. So many thanks, many thanks to Bob, um, and uh, we will now have a, a little um, question-answer session.
Uh, we already got one question, um, which is uh, which is for Bob, um, and uh, the, the questions are: Do we know um, if employees believe in the IPS model? Is it well received? And what about scalability of the model? Is it possible to provide it at countrywide level? So that. Um, were questions that we received now in written. Please feel free. We have a moment now to to um, to answer more questions before we pass on our next speaker. So I will immediately um, maybe let Bob answer that first round of questions, and then we will um, open up for more. Uh, yes, I would like a drink of water, please. So there we go. Um, Employers are surprisingly willing to engage if approached in the right way. Um, in fact, even in times of recession, when jobs are hard to come by, the results of IPS programs remain fairly consistent. Um, it's particularly helpful, of course, if uh, you have a skilled worker who can engage the employer with the idea of giving someone a chance Often employers have themselves um, uh, had experience in their families or themselves of people with mental health problems and are aware of, the, of these difficulties. The whole key to it is, is, is how they are approached. If they are approached in a way that means that firstly they are persuaded that the person in front of them is uh, capable of doing the job and secondly that they will get the support that they need. Anybody who employs anyone is taking a risk. Um, whether you know, and, and, and employers actually are always looking out for what is going to go wrong. And if you've got someone alongside who you already know, an employment support worker, an employment support team, you've had good results before, um, then that risk seems to be mitigated, and, and you are prepared to to give the person more of a chance. Um, in terms of scalability. Um, in the UK, the way it has been done is by integrating employment support teams with community mental health services. Um, there are lots of good reasons for this, but it, it, what it means is that within each team, along with your community mental health nurses, your social workers, your psychologists, your psychiatrists, you have an employment support specialist. Uh, this means that they have the, um, the status um, of being a team member, but it also means that they will be getting support from, as it were, outside the team. Um, and actually quite large areas of the country um, in the UK have at least a minimum employment support service. It is probably the most scalable of all models. It is not building-based like shelter and work. Um, it doesn't. You don't require to have you know an existing institution in which it is. And as long as you've got your community mental health teams, you have the possibility of including employment support within it. So it is probably the most scalable of models. Thank you. And questions keep coming in. So the next one is um, from Chiara Pellegrini. In the middle of the crisis that we are undergoing, where people are losing jobs and firms are closing. What can be reasonably done to help people with mental health uh, problems to find a real job? Isn't protect work better than no work at all? Um, I think the, the, there is a strong argument, and, and I know I've been having discussions with colleagues in Greece as well about this. Um, the, just to take the, 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 the question, um, the principal question, um, what Waddell and Burton found is that, uh, which is the is work good for you uh, study, um, is that um, work good work is good for you. Unemployment is very bad for you indeed. So, in in broad terms, basically yes, having a job of some kind is almost certainly better than not having a job at all. That is what is really damaging. So the answer to your question is, is that is so. What can you do in, in time when times are really bad? When things, well, the, 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 I think really this is where social firms and cooperatives come into their own because um, 
again, it's 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 tricky. Starting a business is difficult, um, you know, and there are all sorts of, of things that, that can go wrong. But um, certainly, I think um, in 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 Greece and Italy, and in Italy over a, a lot of years, um, then cooperatives have managed the process of providing. Which jobs, which are by any standards pretty real jobs, certainly in in, in the open open labour market, um, and better to have a try at doing that um, than give up altogether. But nonetheless, what I think is important is to remember that recession and the kind of stresses in the economy don't go on forever. It may feel like they do, but they don't. And you have to, you can't let employers have the idea. That it is not their job to employ disabled people and people with mental health problems. So, basically, you do have to continue to try to find people jobs in the real in in, in the employment market uh, as they arise, because there will come good times when it is possible for people to do that. Meanwhile, you've got your cooperatives and your social groups. So here comes a question from Jean Geneviève Fitz. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, for both, again, can you talk a bit about how to make the job support as invisible as possible? Uh, what about the employees' co-workers? Um, how to make sure that this support is discreet? Yes, um, certainly when this job coach model I referred to at the very beginning started, and then people with intellectual disabilities had a worker, another worker, alongside them in factory or the workplace or wherever it was and it was extremely visible and this is clearly inappropriate for people uh, with mental health problems these days they don't want to have someone working alongside them as a visible support what I would what I found really um, helpful in this because in fact you know building relationships in the workplace and helping people build relationships in the workplace knowing what to disclose about yourself and who to disclose it to is a very important part of surviving the workplace. This goes for everybody, not just not just people with a stigmatizing condition. Everybody chooses what they want to reveal about themselves in the workplace. And one of the things that um, an employ a good employment support worker will do will have a communication plan with the person, with the employee, and with their line manager. Uh, to say, okay, well, look, you know, what do people need to know? What do people not need to know? Um, it's um, the, uh, Professor Jeff Wackhorn in, in Queensland, in Australia, has done some very, very good work on this and has, has provided um, uh, what is called uh, a disclosure support scheme, which enables people, and one doesn't need to have a mental health problem to use this, to actually think about with someone else, well, what do I want other people to know? What do they need to know? What and how do I say if I, you know, what do I say if, if I suddenly find that someone has uh, got worried about something or found out something? What do I say? So discretion is all, but you don't necessarily need to conceal everything. Uh, and indeed, there will perhaps be a process which gradually people can be more open about what their experience has been, what their life experience has been. Um, and that will then be a very positive thing rather than a negative one. And what's your opinion on job carving? Do you think that's a strategy for a standalone method? This is a question that comes from Mirko um, Michelis. Well, I think, I think you know, uh, there's nothing incompatible between individual placement support and job carving. If you can, if you can uh, persuade employers to do this, I don't, I, without the support element, Job carving is like more or less like anything else, really. It doesn't really quite fulfil all, the, uh, manage all the barriers. But no, it, it's something that um, is another way, basically, of bypassing some aspects that are almost always discriminatory of the usual recruitment processes. Um, so I, I think it is certainly something that, that you know, is worth considering depending on the industry, depending on what the local labour market conditions are. Because that, that's the other thing about IPS, is that it's, it's geared to finding out and acting upon whatever the local labour market conditions are. It's no use saying, you know, 
it's good at finding people jobs in a particular industry or particular kinds of industry. Everywhere is different. Every labour market is different. The employment support worker's job by going out and meeting employers and talking to them and thinking with them about what the local labour market needs, that's how the local schemes will be locally successful. Now, um, Charlotte Portier is asking us what would be the main improvements that could be done to the IPS model? Um, in your opinion, can it be any better? Um, the, I think the model is um, being developed quite substantially um, and, and is actually quite sophisticated. What I think is um, important is I mean, there are two there are, there are a number of things probably one could look at whether IPS could be adapted for other groups of people who find it difficult to get into the labor market within the provision of IPS itself then I think the the key to improvement is is to actually tra take very seriously the idea which I put forward earlier which is that actually you look within your service to continuous improvement of results. If you don't seem to be getting results, if your fidelity reviews are poor or your outcomes are poor, because sometimes the, the two are not the same. Uh, it is interesting. People sometimes find that their fidelity review is excellent and their results are rubbish. Um, and then, and, and it's the results, frankly, that are important. If your results are not up to scratch, then something is not going well, and it is then up to you to look at whether, firstly, you're doing what you should be doing, and secondly, whether you've got the analysis of the local labour market right. The, the, the longer term aim must be to establish services that will go on working and will continue to be supported and will continue to go on building relationships with local employers. And, uh, time and energy and supervision are the key things there. So I think there was another question here. Um, so Eva Pernusi, and I'm sorry, again, if I mispronounced your name, um, states that it seems that implementing IPS goes uh, hand in hand with the social disability model, which is something that we, that we very much think and believe in. Yeah. Um, Bob's, what's your view or your stance um, on uh, mental health workers? Do they have to be successful with their training? I, I hope I understood the question correctly. I'm not sure I do. Um, mental health workers um, are a very important partner. The, the, you know, the, to the person and their employment specialist, and the you know the, the the mental health workers and the employment support workers form a team. So it's success is about it's about teamwork really. Um, there's and, and one of the, the the big barriers can be that the employment support worker is detached from. The, the mental health worker and is not working alongside them. But I'm not quite clear, and I don't know whether you can explain a bit more what you mean by mental health workers being successful. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't really answer that. So we're reading through the another question. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, good. Um, so what... Um, what is your view on the stance that mental health workers need to take to be successful um, with helping people into work, I assume? I mean, certainly the, um, the attitude of mental health workers is important. Um, one of the things that um, many mental health teams do is to indicate that they regard getting people a job, those people who want a job, a job is being important is to make sure that from the beginning when people walk into the community mental health team's office or whatever then they are informed about the employment support work. So from the beginning it's yes okay well you know you may not feel ready for work now but, but one of our th thoughts is that you know sometime you may well want to get a paid job and we are here to help you and that if that's coming from the mental health worker and the mental health team that's a very powerful message um, and um, the, the 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 kind of traditional no no 
is the, the psychiatrist who, when diagnosing someone with schizophrenia, says because he thinks it will uh, um, be tr truthful and honest, you'll never work again. So we have to move from that position of actually saying people are incapable of work to a position where mental health workers are saying, yes, along the line, you will recover if, and you will get a job if you want to. That is the very positive thing. And I will be supporting you and with working with your employment support worker, um, with your permission, of course, but working with them to help you achieve your ambitions. So that's it, really. And, and you know, if, you're, if your health fails, then we will support you and we will not give up on the idea of you keeping your job. You know, we will try and support you um, as a mental health team so that you can keep your job, so that you can remain in work, um, and what could be a more hopeful message? So we have one last question. Um, does IPS include specific strategies to cope with losing the job or transition between jobs? And these questions comes from me. Yes, um, and that, that's part of the follow-on supports being continuous. The, there is a, a good deal of data being kept on how long people keep this first job. Now when you think about it, of course, we all stay a limited amount of time in our first job. So the number of times people change their jobs or lose their jobs is, is not regarded as necessarily a problem. The point is that with IPS, once you're in the service, then you are in the service, not uh, in the service until you lose your job when you're abandoned. Likewise, supposing you get promotion, supposing you are asked to take on a new role within your work, and you think that's a jolly good idea, but am I up to it? Then that's the point where you actually then will be able to discuss with your employment support worker how to make that transition to a more responsible job. Um, and, and the notion of continuous employment, when teams are keeping their record, it's not whether they kept their first job or not, but how long they've been working during the period they've been with the team. That's really what's important. So it is expected that people will change or lose jobs. And the question then is, well, how we, do we then make sure that there is another job, that the next job is better, that gradually we build something called a career, because that's the object in the, uh, and, and we know so far that probably about a third of the people who get work from IPS services eventually go on to build careers. Now that may not sound a huge percentage, but it's a damn sight better than we've ever achieved before. Uh, and that means people are really on the way to full income. So many thanks to everyone for this first round of questions, and thank you very much, Bob, for, for the presentation. Um, we are now really pleased um, to pass on the floor to our colleague and friend Stefan Trona, uh, who will join us from Geneva. Um, and he's a senior disability specialist from the International Labor, or Labor Organization. And Bob and I were very keen to use the highlighter, but I think that, that, web, that, uh, that Stefan is more familiar with the, with the webinar than we were, so I'm sorry for the little breakdowns we had so far. And now, welcome to Stefan. Can you hear us? Yes, Maria, I can hear you. Uh, I think you can also see me. I think the image is a bit dark, but uh, I hope that's that's okay. I can I can try to close uh, the window a bit more if you want. Do you want me to try, or should I go with like that? Okay. Um, well, uh, thanks thanks for inviting me to the to the webinar, um, and. Um, and I think I've been listening to, with very much interest to, to both of you. Uh, and I think, um, in particular, Bob's presentation and some of these things I would be saying are quite complementary with, with each other. Um, uh, I, am, um, I work in the International Labour Organization, which is uh, here based here in Geneva, our headquarters. The ILO, for those of you who don't know so much, is the United Nations Specialized Agency in the area of um, employment and social protection. And I am uh, the head of a small disability team uh, here in the, in the ILO, through which we try to um, promote the employment of uh, people with disabilities, uh, which of course also includes people with um, psychosocial disabilities 
uh, to use that term. Um, the angle that I will take in my presentation is based on the work that we have been doing over the last couple of years, I would say, um, in particular with companies on the issue of mental health at work. Uh, and in particular, uh, we are in, here in the ILO, we, uh, we coordinate uh, the Global Business and Disability Network, which is a coming together of large disability organiz uh, large um, companies that have a global presence who are committed to promoting the employment of people with disabilities. And what, um, what we did with, with that group, um, we, um, in, back in 2015, um, we um, organized uh, one of our annual events of this network and we brought a speaker from the, from the OECD um, to speak specifically about mental health at work, to basically to bring that issue, which was rather new, to the attention of this group of companies and I must say also to ourselves as the ILO. And uh, some of the th uh, things that this speaker said to us really um, st struck a note with, with companies. On one hand, the, the large numbers we're talking about when we speak about mental health as a, as a condition um, in terms of how prevalent, how frequent it is in, in the general population and the significant impact mental health issues have in terms of absenteeism of, um, from, the, from the work and what OECD calls presentism, or people that go to work but are not able to deliver at the usual level of uh, productivity because uh, they are facing some problems, in this case uh, mental health problems, which um, as they are usually trying not to disclose, are leading to, um, to, to a lower level of performance. And of course, both th these issues uh, were particularly relevant for companies. Um, and the OCD colleague also, sh also shared with us uh, the available information in terms of employment rates of people with uh, psychosocial disabilities, which of course showed that uh, they're much more likely to be uh, out of the labor market. Uh, we all know that. I must say that uh, when we started the work on mental health at work, we, we soon realized that in fact we were not exclusively working on disability. L let me explain. On one hand, we have the issue about and Maria, you raised it when you were using uh, different terminologies. Sometimes you're using psychosocial disability, so that we are using disability terminology. So some people with mental health condition would qualify, so to say, as disabled people, and would perhaps then and would then be covered under disability legislation, provision of reasonable adjustment, and all that, which is usually provided in the context of disability. Uh, while for other people. Um, in, in that continuum, they might not, for whatever reasons, um, either see themselves nor be uh, qualified as, as having a disability. No. Um, so that, that's the first um, thing that we realized when we started to work here, is, is the, 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 there are a bit of a fluid borders between what is, is a disability or are we talking beyond disability. The second element that we realized was bringing us a bit outside our usual disability zone was the fact that when we started to, to see with companies what they should be doing to generate a workplace that would be conducive to providing employment of, to people with uh, mental health conditions, um, we realized that some of those measures that, we, that companies were implementing were in fact benefiting the, 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 whole, uh, the whole of their workforce and not just, they were not just measures targeting specific um, groups of, of people. So, so that was a bit um, some of the, the initial considerations that I thought were, were relevant to share. And then I think it's also interesting, uh, it, it was clear from the outset that once uh, companies were confronted with this issue, um, they immediately, or many of them immediately uh, realized the huge relevance of the issue. In particular, um, not so much because they were thinking of employing people with psychosocial disabilities, of using the IPS scheme, as, uh, as Bob explained. So that's why I think we are we're having a complementary approach. But because companies were perfectly aware that within their current workforce, there were already a lot of colleagues that were facing different types of mental health conditions. 
and leading to absenteeism and leading to presentism and all that. As I said, not, not always defined as disability, but definitely having a significant impact on companies. No? So, so to some extent, there was a selfish interest uh, by, from companies to get involved in this discussion and to learn more about how better to deal with this situation. And let me also quite op openly admit that we in, in the International Labour Organization, while we have been doing some work on this general uh, environment in terms of how to create a, a workplace that is uh, good from a mental health perspective, uh, we have not at all looked at any of the other dimensions that I will briefly explain in a minute. But it's also fair to say that if you ask me and probably many other UN organizations how good we are in terms of um, accommodating mental health issues at work, we, we have a lot to learn from, from other organizations and in particular from some of the companies that we have been able to identify that I think have really an, are doing an outstanding job in this context. So what I will be sharing with you is basically the work that we did um, mostly throughout 2016, which in fact led to an expert meeting that we held here in, in Geneva in, uh, in October 2016. Uh, representative from Mental Health Europe was, was here with us and, and, and uh, also contributed um, to that meeting. Um, and let me also uh, just briefly mention that uh, when we we produced a report for that meeting, which is basically a report through which we were identifying company practices um, that we thought were, uh, were, were useful for other companies to consider. Um, we also had a certain discussion around what terminology to use, and at the end uh, we agreed to use um, the term mental health conditions as, a, um, I would say, a, a, term, a term which we think is not stigmatizing and which to some extent um, covers the, the continuum of situation uh, and would, let's say, I would not only focus on, on, on situations, that, let's say, that are, that are more severe or that could qualify as disabled, but also what some differ, um, uh, would, 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 would uh, define as uh, common mental disorders or whatever terminology we want to use. No? So um, we did this work in 2016. Uh, we, we found a number of companies, not, not many, but some companies, in particular in the UK, and in Canada, um, British Telecom, for instance, uh, some Canadian companies like, like Bell, Siemens in Germany has a quite uh, proactive approach, at least on some components of, um, of how to deal with issues of mental health at work. And um, what we did is we, we brought all these, um, uh, we did a mapping of company practices because um, what we had set ourselves as objective of this specific work was really to be helpful to other companies on showing them the way on how to address uh, mental health issues. We are perfectly aware that this is only covering one dimension of the work. It's important to, to that, that policies are doing the right thing. Um, we attended an OECD meeting where an uh, interesting um, study was presented on, on mental health at work. And for instance, one of the main findings that I remember from that meeting and, and that study was very much what what Bob was sharing before, which was basically very often policies are designed following the logic of other health situations, which is basically you have a health problem, you break your leg, or you have some, some problem. So you, you go out of the labor market, something happens to you, you're, you're cured, so to say, and then you're coming back uh, cured to, the, to your previous job, so to say. No? While this in the context of mental health did not make a lot of sense, and uh, so there was a strong recommendation coming out of that meeting that to, be, to see work as part of the solution of uh, treating mental health situations, so very much in line with um, what Bob was presenting. I must say that also at that stage I had a similar uh, question in my mind, yeah, but, but what about if, 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 the actual, if the work environment has been so bad and has contributed to mental health conditions? No? And so to some extent that, that takes us back to this issue about we are talking about good work uh, that is helpful to as part of uh, dealing with, with mental health um, situations. So 
in this report and in this expert meeting we organized uh, in October 2016, um, let me just take you through the continuum of situations that we presented. The first area that we tackled was basically what needs companies to do to generate an environment which is good from a mental health perspective. Now, of course, that can be very broad. Good management is something that very often comes up. And we all know how good or bad ma how bad management definitely is not very helpful from a mental health perspective. But there are also more organizational wide issues in terms of wellness, in terms of uh, mindfulness. Very often not necessarily uh, labeled as targeting mental health situation. Also because sometimes that might have some, some um, stigmatizing effect. But really sort of looking broadly at, uh, sit, uh, at issues, for instance, like um, conciliation of family and work life, all these general issues that contribute to an environment which um, hopefully will not contribute to mental health situation. And I think it's also fair to say it's an environment that would be good for people with, that are currently, for whatever reasons, facing mental health condition. So that is like the first area. There are a number of tools that um, different organizations have produced uh, in the EU, in Canada. Uh, it's very developed. Uh, also the ILO has its own um, tool, which are basically, some of those are tools that are called tools that are doing some sort of psychosocial risk assessment. Basically as one of the tools through, that, are, that are used in the context of occupational health and safety, you know, which basically tries to not just uh, react to problems, but really try to prevent workplace accidents, and in this context, to prevent situations around stress and, and, and other mental health related issues. So that is the first area of work um, that we thought that companies should consider when looking at this continuum of, um, of work um, in this context. The, the, second, um, the second area that we addressed in that um, in that report is um, what what companies need to do to create an environment that is stigma free from uh, from a mental health point of view. We all know that um, while other disabilities are also very often um, faced with uh, stigmatizing situations, definitely there there is a much larger stigma attached to mental health and. Um, which, for instance, would not make somebody with a mental health conditions, mental health condition, for instance, uh, come to a job interview and uh, inform the interview panel that he or she has had a history of mental health conditions. We, we all know that that is not normally what, what is happening because there's a lot of stigma associated with it. So we, we've tried to identify a number of company examples where, this, uh, where they have taken proactive steps in terms of generating an environment that sort of takes away these, the, the stigma cons, um, associated with, with mental health. Uh, a campaign in Canada by, by Bell, a large uh, telephone company that comes to mind, which basically is something like we said, let's talk. And I was just interested very, a couple of weeks ago I saw that a similar initiative had been led by, uh, by the, World Health, the World Health Organization, um, which was basically um, starting a campaign for their own staff in terms of let's talk about depression. I mean, it was restricted to depression, but I think it, I thought it was interesting to see that um, that approach in terms of just put the issue on the agenda, try to sort of take away people's concerns, and um, and generate an open uh, discussion on that. Um, the, the next element that we addressed was directly connected with uh, reasonable accommodation in the workplace. We've, we've heard, Maria has reminded us, that especially for people who qualify as having a disability, including psychosocial disability, there is an obligation on the side of employers to provide a reasonable accommodation. Uh, but it's also fair to say that uh, while reasonable accommodation in other contexts for people with physical disability or sensory disabilities um, there's more knowledge or there's more more extended knowledge in terms of how to provide these accommodations. There's not the same level of knowledge um, on what type of accommodations are required in, in, the, in, in the situation of a mental health condition. Um, 
what we realized, what we saw is basically, first, I mean, it's very basic, I mean, very, very straightforward uh, solutions uh, like those that, that Maria was, um, was, was sharing, uh, flexibility in working time, um, rearrangement sometimes of, of the workspace. Definitely, I would say, changes that have almost always no direct cost implication. But okay, if they have, that's still, uh, this would also be covered. However, the, the main problem um, linked to reasonable accommodation in the context of a mental health condition and disability, and we would argue that even if the person would, does not have a disability, reasonable accommodation should not be limited only to those that have a certified disability, but should really apply across the board. And we just have launched recently a guide for employers on recent adjustments and even made a very clear case that this is not only a relevant issue for people with disabilities, it's also for other groups um, a, a relevant issue. But the, the, the real challenge in the context of people with, uh, with mental health conditions in terms of reasonable accommodation is the issue of disclosure. Right? So, and, and that's where I would make the link with the previous point. So evidence shows that um, usually people with mental health condition the main reason why they would disclose to their employer, um, to their manager and to the relevant staff, not to the whole you know, workforce, because that's, that's not the need, but let's say the main reason for people with mental health condition to re disclose that they are, have such a mental health condition is when they are requiring or requesting a reasonable accommodation. If those, in those cases, if the reasonable accommodation has to be justified by the person having a specific situation, then the person usually will need to, to think whether or not to disclose that situation. And then it's, it's where this stigma-free environment that I just mentioned comes in. Because what, what we have seen definitely is that if people feel that disclosing their mental health condition will not only not lead perhaps to a reasonable adjustment, but might even lead to being invited at some stage to, um, to find a job somewhere else, uh, well, of course, there are people with disabilities, with mental health conditions, will not, will not uh, take that step. And I think that's, that's one of the big difference between any visible disability, but in this context even more, because it's a, it's a stigmatized invisible disability, when compared with visible disabilities. I mean, if you are a wheelchair user or blind, I mean, you don't need to disclose your disability. Everybody can see that straight away. No? So that is... Um, Another very important element that came out of, of the work, how to generate, um, what are the processes that need to be followed for people with disabilities, for people with mental health conditions to be, to feel safe enough to disclose. And then of course, even if, when, if they decide to disclose because they, they, they feel that this will be not badly used and it will lead to an adjustment, still of course there are confidentiality and privacy issues that need to be respected. And it's of course very important that unless the person wants to speak about her, her or his situation, definitely that information should only be available to the key people that are involved in the provision of such a, of such a reasonable accommodation. Another issue that came up during that discussion in, in October was, do people with mental health conditions who will require most likely a workplace adjustment almost from the start of their job, should they already um, speak about that and refer to that during the interview phase? And there were very different views. Now, from a legal perspective, some were saying, well, it's, it's a breach of confidence if you don't raise that issue um, at that context. Others, with, were, others knew definitely that if the person would raise that issue during the interview, that would most likely not lead to, um, to being offered a job, even if the person has the, um, the best qualification. So this was uh, an example of that. Of course, um, the whole idea about um, being able to be given a reasonable accommodation has a clear link with being able to retain your job, and that's the whole purpose, that you're finding a solution that could prevent, ideally, the person from, um, from, um, from needing to be out of work for a certain while. So it has a strong job retention component. Uh, but at the same time, of course, also, and, and, and the guide and, and, uh, and the background report and the meeting, we also discussed issues around return to work, because it's also a fact that many people at some stage, for whatever reasons, would need to, um, to be out of the labor market for, for a certain time. 
uh, but it's a very strong recommendation that uh, companies should uh, make all the possible efforts to stay in contact with the person, um, to reassure the person that uh, they will not lose their job um, as soon as they are able to, to come back, and of course also then once, and to plan very well um, the return to work in terms of welcoming them, in terms of uh, discussing uh, a gradual take up of, of work if, if needed, perhaps not going back on a full time schedule, discussing immediately what uh, adjustments need to be done in order to, um, for that return to work to be, um, to be a success. The one element we did not uh, tackle in the background report and in the meeting is exactly the, and that's why I was saying that Bob's presentation and, and I think my presentation nicely complement each other, is the whole focus on what shall we do to get people that have, already, that have a psychosocial disability um, before they are, um, to get them into the labor market. You know, that either they, 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 they left the labor market or they've, they've never been in the labor market. We raised during the EXCEPT meeting also the, the issue of, of, of youth with mental health condition. We have a big concern around that also here in the ILO because there's a big risk of, um, of them never being able to make it into the labor market and, and that's definitely going into an absolutely vicious cycle in terms of um, no work leading to mental health problems, mental health problems leading to no work, etc., etc. So this uh, element of um, how to get people with psychosocial disability into the labor market, um, using, for instance, um, the IPS system scheme, which we looked at during during our work, we uh, did not focus so much on on that. Um, because we, to some extent we had the, also the, let's say the, the assumption that if we would be able to, um, to work with companies to generate with the different um, steps that I have described very briefly, if we would be able to um, promote companies that are able to deal with all these issues related to mental health at work, we would probably be contributing to creating companies that would also be a welcoming environment for people who already have a psychosocial disability, let's say, before entering um, the labor market. Because I think to some extent, um, and I was just, when I'm listening to the questions that uh, Bob got, and this is my last comment, just Maria, for you to know that you have to take over in a minute. Um, when, you, when Bob was asked about um, what are the elements that um, through which could be strengthened the IPS. I think the IPS system was very well explained and I'm sorry I've, I, I've, I've learned a lot from the presentation. What I think our work um, addresses which is perhaps not so much addressed and because that's not the objective of an IPS scheme is while on the, on the one hand with the IPS you're working on with the individual and his immediate uh, surrounding the work that we have been trying to promote is generating the, let's say, the environment in the, company, in, in the companies to be a welcoming environment for, uh, for people with, with, with mental health conditions. So I think if you bring bo both of those uh, elements together, I think uh, we would be in, in, in a quite good situation. Maria, I think uh, I, I leave it there. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, the, the light is so bright in Geneva. It's, it's surprisingly nice weather <laughs> these days. Normally it's a bit... It's a bit grayer, so it, you would have been able to see me a bit better, but I hope that at least my, my voice came through. Okay, thank you. For your presentation, which was very complimentary to the previous ones. Um, I think that the issue of disclosure was really, really interesting um, and it might uh, be worth discussing a little bit more. We have one question that came in, um, which comes from Dominica, um, on how can employers diagnose or identify um, that a person, that an employee has a mental health problem? So um, I don't know if you want to, to comment on that, um, otherwise I'll leave the floor also to Bob. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I can say something about that. Um, I think that one of the, and I forgot to mention that, one of the um, 
key players that uh, came up time and time and again in the discussion at the exit meeting la last October was the role of line managers. Um, and to some extent, uh, we <laughs> At the end, we almost call them like the super women and supermen have to be line managers because, of course, they have to do so many things. But definitely, one of the things that a good line manager should do is not to diagnose mental health situation because, I mean, that that's you need um, expertise from from elsewhere. And sometimes the medical department of a company could do it if it's a large company, otherwise from outside. But what we felt was that line managers should be trained um, in order to be able to identify situations that were arising within their team which could signal mental health situations. Now that would not, and there was also like, like a message at the end, please on Monday morning everybody is, is, is feeling sad so let me don't overdo it in terms of thinking that immediately somebody has, has a mental health condition. But if line managers see that suddenly one of their team members is permanently not meeting deadlines, suddenly being very disruptive in, in staff meetings, having very complicated relations with their colleagues. Um, line managers should be trained, and that is really something that is not happening, um, should be trained to know how to deal with those situations. How to engage in a dialogue with that person in a careful way, right? because I mean, it's not about sort of really saying, can I help you? Can, do you need some support? To bring in some Many companies are more and more uh, giving possibilities for their staff to get some, some counseling for free. I mean, the different solutions that, that, that companies have. But it's very important that, that line managers are able to identify those situations, as I said, not in order to diagnose any type of, but just to, to identify that there is a problem, to know how to carefully address that problem in dialogue with that person in a very respectful way. Because sometimes the person might be aware that he or she has a problem. Sometimes the person might be aware but not willing to, to, to accept it. I mean, we have a continuum again of situations. So it's very important for the line manager to be able to deal with those situations and then in collaboration with that person as much as possible then to get the, the adequate, let's say, uh, professional advice on, on how to deal with situations. No? So as I said, it's not for me the diagnosis issue, but it's, it's this role of line managers to be who are the ones in the front line, who are the ones that will, um, that will see that something is happening, I think they, they, they play a key role in, in this process. Okay, uh, couldn't agree more. Absolutely central. And um, the only thing I would say is that um, there are programs that have been developed um, and which are used to do just what Stefan has been suggesting, which is not to turn line managers into diagnosticians, but to enable them to have conversations with people that uh, when they spot that there's someone in distress. And the, the I mean, the, the ones that seem to have been most developed um, in, in our country is called Mental Health First Aid. Um, BT, for example, British Telecom have adapted their own version of it as part of their drive to uh, educate their line managers on how to deal with people's distress. Um, the other is an Australian uh, program called Beyond Blue. Um, both of these are available online and you can uh, see, see what, what they involve. I just add one third thing. Not only do line managers need to know how to have the conversation, they also need to know what they can then do as far as their company is concerned. They need to know where help can be found uh, from within their company and, and to know what to say to the person. Okay, you've got this person in distress in front of you and you can talk to them about it and you know, be, be positive and enable them to have adjustments and that kind of thing. But you know, what, what then? Is there something else that you can say, well, and we have a counselling service or whatever. It's important that people know. The other thing that, um, and it's another, just to add to something that Stephen said about keeping in contact, people uh, I know now know that they should keep in contact with people who are off sick through mental ill health. Doing it is quite another thing. And what BT have done is to develop a system whereby not only do line managers get a reminder when someone has been off sick for a couple of weeks with a, a, that, that they should be in contact with them, but they also give them a script 
tell them what to say, give them the kind of ideas that they might develop that are going to make the person feel better rather than worse. Um, and so that's another aspect of this, this training. That's why I want to say. Um, there are some other questions coming in as well, and um, indeed, I mean, please, please ask your questions. Um, it's the moment. Um, one question, which is uh, maybe more for Stefan, um, is how are all the things we discussed? Um, how can they apply to people with refugee status or asylum seekers, as many of those persons have mental health problems, um, often unrecognized as a result of trauma? Um, and there is also a very hostile climate in many of the EU member states towards refugees, asylum seekers. Um, Stefan, do you have anything to, to respond to this question that comes from Anna Zobina? Well, uh, a, big, a big question. Um, um, the only thing I can say is that um, the ILO has started to work with the UN High Commission for Refugees. Um, uh, both organizations had, a, had an MOU for many years ago. They just signed a new MOU in last year uh, because of the current refugee crisis. Uh, and uh, surprisingly enough, um, the ILO had not been paying too much attention in general to the situation of refugees. I mean, all refugees, not, I'm not talking about refugees with disabilities. So um, this uh, collaboration now is hopefully will lead to more um, focus on uh, on refugees in terms of um, providing them with um, with progress for livelihood and, and all that because basically the the main conclusion not a, not a surprising but we all know that situation of refugees right now is not a temporary situation I mean people go into refugee status and they might be there for one or two generations unfortunately so to some extent um, that led the UNHCR, the UN High Commission for Refugees, to pay much more attention to livelihood situations versus, let's say, the emergency intervention. And, uh, and that, of course, paying more attention to livelihood has, has been logic in bringing them closer to the ILO because we have a more development approach to providing to all people employment uh, situations in, in different contexts. But I must say, not so much until now in the refugee context. So I hope, hopefully, but this really it's, it's very much starting right now in the, in the last couple of months. Hopefully, we can bring into that discussion the issue of refugees with disabilities more generally. People who already had a disability before the crisis, people who acquired a disability through the crisis, including through um, through um, people with, with with mental health situation, which definitely is, is very prevalent in, in those contexts. And um, let's say the disability focal point in, in the UN High Commission for Refugees and, and our team here, we are trying now to find ways to, um, to sort of work together and, 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 and raise the awareness within this very complicated context also of, of refugees with disabilities, including with, with, with mental health conditions. So thanks for the question, but I mean, not an easy one, I must say. Not an easy one, but uh, it was already really helpful and we'll be happy to, to continue to be updated from, from your side about this because um, that was very helpful. Um, a question from Claudia, um, maybe for Bob now. Um, are the good practices not the good practices that exist, are they normally available and implemented by all types of organizations, from the big corporations to the small and medium enterprises? Uh, and if not, uh, what could be done to, to improve for people with poor mental health in smaller companies? Um, the answer is that on the whole it is the big corporations with the resources that uh, where they do um, introduce these kind of good practices uh, that, that they are able to resource them and on the whole small companies don't use them. There are exceptions to this. We, we have an organization in UK called the Mindful Employer, which has a lot of local and small company members, um, and they meet regularly and uh, sign up to certain practices and share issues and problems with each other through rather in the same way that uh, little local employers associations do. So that seems like probably the, the most likely way forward, and, and sometimes also the big companies will try and introduce things through their supply chain. 
Um, personally, I think that would be would be an, uh, an excellent notion. Is if actually some of our leading companies who really have got it in terms of mental health start using their both their good example and their muscle as big companies to get their supply chain working on the same lines, that I think would probably make the biggest difference. So um, thank you, Bob. We have uh, questions. We have, we have a lot of questions. Um, one now is for, for Stefan. Uh, by the way, Stefan, uh, Helena Quesada is asking, and, and we would uh, we share that, that question, um, is it possible to get your, your speaking notes? Because then we will share them among the participants. Um, the question comes from Eva Deinsik. Um, sorry for my pronunciation again. How would you say that mental health literacy connects to your findings, um, Stefan, especially in regard to the workplace atmosphere? I pass on the, the mic to you. Yes, uh, well, f just to confirm that, yes, I, I will put my speaking notes in order. I'm sorry that I didn't prepare them before, but uh, it was a ch challenge with other. I mean, could you repeat the question? I, there's one word I didn't get, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't grasp the, the question. Yeah, so, uh, Stefan, how would you say that mental health literacy uh, connects to your findings? especially in regard to workplace atmosphere. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I assume that when you mean mental health literacy would mean knowledge on mental health issues. Um, I think that is it's a relevant question. I think it's, it's what I tried, I think some of the examples I give from, from, gave from companies are trying to address that situation. I think it's very clear that we need to be, it's very clear that um, there's a lot of ignorance around it and, uh, and also a lot of negative perceptions, so that's, that's a challenge. I think we should also not try to sort of uh, over-medicalize the issue because uh, it's, it, we, we all know mental health is, is a very big family of situations and I don't expect um, people to um, sort of now become or need to become experts on, on distinguishing one type of mental health condition from the other. I mean, I don't think that that is what is needed. Uh, during the, the um, October event, we showed um, the recent video that the WHO has produced and led, which is the one called, the, you know, the, the black dog, uh, showing uh, the situation of depression. And, and, and we liked, I mean, yeah, we, we thought that that video was, was, was a nice video, um, was well done, um, three, four minutes, um, showing the challenges, but also showing the way out and, and what people could do. So it's not just uh, describing the situation, but also giving some um, guidance on, on, on how people could, um, could intervene in, in, in these situations. Um, but I said before, in terms of line managers, I think that that is an element of mental health literacy, so to say. And I think the, the more general issue of uh, starting a dialogue, this sort of let's talk about it approach, uh, which, um, which for instance could be done around mental health days. We are considering um, um, for this year's mental health day uh, to, to invite, for instance, somebody uh, with a mental health condition that has uh, had a successful career to come to us and, and speak to my colleagues here because we have here in the ILO and that's I think a very similar problem as, as well, we have a very low level of, of, of mental health literacy. You know? For instance, I know that just a few weeks ago during a Human Rights Council session on mental health, uh, people from, um, from one organization of, of hearing voices was there and, and, and speaking about her particular experience, um, and th when I shared that, even with some of the colleagues working on disability here, they, they had not ever heard about the issue of hearing voices. No? So I just felt, I mean, what it would be very interesting to bring somebody from that organization to s just share with my colleagues here during a, a lunch break, I mean, a one-hour session, just that they come familiar with something that um, it's absolutely new to to most people. So I think that, that is the type of mental health literacy, so to say, if I, if I understood well the question, that I think uh, would, would help in, 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 in getting things uh, forward. 
Many thanks to Tom. Um, Bob? Just a, a small point. Again, I agree entirely with Stefan, but um, I mean, one of the things that's really starting to become recognised in in, uh, in UK, and uh, I speak as someone who is uh, a governor of our local school, is that actually we're starting to include within children's education notions of the mind as well as the body. So uh, for the first time, our local school this year had uh, not only a healthy, a healthy bodies, healthy minds week, at which the kind of issues that age appropriately were discussed around sadness, depression, as we would call it, but the kind of things that children uh, are never encouraged to think about or speak about, but which really they, they have to understand this and, and which they have to learn how to cope with because you know, many children are themselves um, struggling and, and with various kinds of distress and they see their families struggling with it and yet it's unspoken in schools or in any way in education establishments and that's something really we could start changing as part of the general approach to literacy. So we have received one last question because we're a little bit coming to the end of this, of this webinar. So, um, I'm bringing it here from Matthew. How would you address the argument that an employer might make that a potential employee poses a risk due to their mental health um, on the grounds of health and safety? Well, well, I mean, this is a real concern, and you'd have to say, well, you know, is this uh, a realistic worry? And if it is, as with any kind of thing that, uh, that, is, that is quite realistic, then you, you have to address it and say that perhaps not every job uh, is suitable. It's very hard to think of a job where health and safety would be compromised by mental ill health, but I'm sure that, that they exist. I think the, the important point to, to remember is that if the employee, employer is raising this as, as a reason not to consider someone without exploring it, then really they're not the sort of employer that is likely to make a success of any placement, and you may have to move on. Um, it would be very little point, I think, in, in just sort of saying, look, you know, this is you, against the law, you are discriminating. Well, you might say that, but you certainly wouldn't then put that person in, in, in that situation. So, I mean, I think health and safety is important, and if there is uh, an, an issue, uh, then you do have to address it, as with any other worker. Um, but, as I say, also I find it hard to think of jobs where mental ill health would actually compromise health and safety. I can't think of any, actually. So, many thanks Bob, many thanks to Stefan, and uh, many thanks also to all of you who participated uh, in this webinar. Um, as I said in the beginning, we have been recording the, this webinar and it will soon upload it on our website, so we will be able um, to, to, to find it there um, and, um, and share it um, um, if, if you wish. So thank you very, very much to everyone, to my colleagues who have been helping us out with the technicalities. It was a first for us. Um, thanks to Stefan, Bob and all of you. Goodbye.